want to start by telling you a little bit of an episode that happened to me uh, just a few days ago. I was actually uh, hanging out with Joseph. Uh, so Joseph and I were kind of catching up and getting some coffee, and this was at Jewel. And so we'd finished, and we were kind of going to get to the car park. And if you're a little like me, uh, Jewel is a little confusing, right? You go round and round and round, and then car park very, very deep. Right, and so we were at this lift, and we were waiting to go down, and it was taking a while. It was taking a little longer than expected. Then it finally it comes, and then, you know, even though we were earlier, there was a whole other group of people that came, and then that one opened, and then they all rushed in, and then it was full, and then we couldn't go in. Then he had longer wait. Uh, and I realized I was getting a little impatient. Uh, it was good that Joseph was there so that we could chit-chat and kind of, you know, try and get distracted around that. Eventually, the lift came, and it went down. But I was reflecting on this. And I realized that I'm not very good with waiting. Uh, anybody like me? <laughs> you know? Like if you have to wait for something, you kind of get impatient. I'm one of those who would rather take the staircase or the escalator than wait for the lift. You know, so I, I think it's a false idea. I just think I'm doing something to try and help my, my situation. Uh, I'm not sure what you tend to do when you are waiting, um, but um, I try to fill it up with something. Right? I hate kind of just sitting around doing nothing, just waiting around. Hopefully something will happen. Right? So I tend to bring a book with me wherever I go so that in case I have to wait for someone. How do you do uh, in the waiting? Right? Like, like are you... Uh, are you the kind of person who will get on your phone and then, you know, start scrolling, right? Uh, looking at Instagram, playing a, a mobile game. Uh, are you the kind of person who will, you know, fall asleep, right? And just catch up on something uh, else that you want to do. Are you the person who starts daydreaming or you just switch off? What do you do in the waiting? Uh, when you're waiting for someone, uh, when you're waiting for an appointment, when you're waiting for the lift, but there are also circumstances where we have to wait that are a little longer. What do you do when you're waiting for the perfect boyfriend or girlfriend? What do you do when you're waiting to get married? What do you do as you're waiting to get pregnant as a couple? What do you do uh, as, as you wait for your children to grow into the likeness of Christ? What do you do when you're waiting for the kid who is far away from home, far away from faith? and you're waiting for this kid to come home. What, what do you do in the midst of the waiting? There's another question that I think is quite key, and that's this. What should we do in the waiting? You see, as we close this series today, I, I want to encourage us and remind us that we are all waiting, actually, for something to take place. What we are waiting for and longing as believers and as Christians is we're waiting for Jesus to return. We're waiting for the kingdom of God to be fully made manifest on the earth again. We're waiting for the rightful ruler of the earth, of heaven and earth, to come back and take his rightful place. Can somebody say amen? amen. But what do we do while we wait? What should we do while we wait? Do we just continue to come to church services? <laughs> do we, uh, and the answer is yes. <laughs> Do we just continue to read our Bibles and do our little thing and sing our songs? What should we be doing in the midst of our waiting? As I said, this is a series we're just calling Five Through Five, and we've taken the last five weeks to look at parables. And in these five parables, there's something significant that God speaks to us about His world, about His way, about His heart for us. And by now, I hope you're getting an idea of what parables are about. And my heart has always been, whenever we do these five to five series, is for two things. One, you will receive a word that is now for you and me, but also we will get an understanding of how we can read and approach God's word on our own. And so I hope a little bit now you are not afraid of parables, and the next time you find yourself reading a parable in the Scripture, you're not afraid because you know what you need to think about and how you need to enter into that parable. What are parables? Remember, parables are stories. They're made up stories. They're made up by uh, using the situations or the circumstances around them. But they're made up because Jesus wants us to understand something beyond our world. Some people say it like this. They are earthly stories about heavenly realities. And I think that's a nice way to think of it. Earthly stories about heavenly realities. But because they are told in a way that sometimes can be a little confusing, it is meant for us to enter like a maze 
And when you're in this maze, you need to figure out how to get out, how to make sense of it. Very often, the parables are not surface parables. There's something else going on underneath. Jesus is saying something without saying something. And so we need to get into the story. And this was a wonderful way in which Jesus would teach. And we don't like that, right? We, like, we, we wish Jesus would say, here is point number one. Here is point number two. Here's point number three, right? I always say, Jesus, send me an email. I'll be very happy, you know? Monday morning, Jesus sent me an email. These are all the things I need to do. Yes, sir. But no, Jesus says, here's a story. Step into the story so you will understand and know me and know my ways through that. Now, the word parable in its original language really comes from this idea of comparing. And so whenever you think of a parable, you read a parable, we're looking for the points of comparison. What is actually being compared in the story? Because oftentimes there is a little twist that happens. And that's where we pay attention because the point is often in the twist. Jesus told parables because he was revealing to us about his kingdom, revealing to us about the kingdom of God. And sometimes when you read the New Testament, particularly the book of Matthew, you might find that Matthew uses a different phrase. He says the kingdom of heaven. Now, in case you're ever wondering, is this something else? No, it is in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is actually the same thing. The reason Uh, Matthew would use the kingdom of heaven uh, is because of their belief and understanding that the name of God was very sacred. And so they wouldn't want to say the name of God too often. So instead of saying the the, the kingdom of God, they would say the kingdom of heaven. So it was just a, a, a change. It was just a different word to express the same things because of the way they would honor the name of God. Sidebar, today it seems we don't seem to honor the name of God very much. Right? If you think of movies and the way it's used, it's just used often uh, as negative words, right? But they believe that the name of God was incredibly sacred, and so they wouldn't use it. And so instead of saying kingdom of God, they would say the kingdom of heaven. And so today as we land the series, we're going to look at the parable of the talents. If you have a Bible with you, it's going to be in Matthew 25. But if you don't, I'm going to put the text up on the screen so we can follow along as well. If you've been a Christian, my guess is you've heard this story. Um, But I'm going to start as I have with all the others in the series and say, I think there's something else often going on than we are often used to hearing. So here's the thing. It's called the parable of talents, but this parable isn't about talents. So what is it really going to be about? Let's have a read through this text. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one, he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants uh, came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents here. I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful or lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I should have received what was my own uh, own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. 
from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What's going on in this story? What's actually happening when Jesus tells this story? We're going to try and unpack it by looking through it again and making some observations, right? Nudge the person next to you and say, get ready. So as we think about this, the text in the story starts with the word for. And whenever you see the word for, you realize it's there because of something else. So let's get back to what this situation is about. Very often when we hear this passage talked about, we can think of it in terms of, "Ah, I know what Jesus is saying, must be good managers of money. Is God saying be good managers of money? Yes, but not from this story. Right? God wants us to be good managers and stewards of resource that we have. But there's something else in this story, something else that we need to unpack and figure out. So this is not just a a series of uh, instructions on how we should multiply our money or multiply in our investments. I've sometimes heard people do that. They take the story and say, okay, here's what we need to do in terms of investment banking and, you know, a a variety of things like that. These stories were not about ethics. These stories had to reveal a spiritual, heavenly truth. So what was going on? Why did Jesus even tell us the story? We need to figure out the situation. And in fact, it doesn't begin in chapter 25. You have to go one chapter before that. In Matthew chapter 24, we actually get the situation. Jesus had been preaching all day, and he was very successful in his preaching ministry. And now he goes up to this mountain, the Mount of Olives. And he's there because he wants to replenish. He's tired. He wants to sit down. But as he sits down, the disciples come to him privately. So now remember, the audience is going to be Jesus' disciples. They come to him privately and they say these things. They say, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? You see, Jesus had just been teaching everybody about how the temple is going to be destroyed and then in three days it will come back. And they were like, what does this mean? So in private, Jesus' disciples are sitting with him and Jesus is now going to talk about these issues. It has to do with his return. This parable is about his return and what we do while we wait for his return. It's not about money management. So this is a thing, this is a question, this is a circumstance that we need to pay attention to. So keep this in the back of your head so that as we go through this story, we will understand what's happening. So what does Jesus do when they say, tell us about the end? How many of you would like to know what's going to happen in the end times? Okay, eight of you, wonderful. I always find it's only, only the same eight people. No, actually it's a lot more people. <laughs> but my number always comes to eight because I can't count. So here's what happens, right? They also want to know what's going to happen to the end times or at the end times. Jesus says there's going to be a bunch of signs. Now, we in the Christian world today, we love to talk about this. Is this a sign of the coming? Is is the pandemic a sign of the, you know, we want to know are these the things that's telling us that Jesus is coming back? I will tell you categorically, the answer is yes. They're all signs. They're not the thing. And actually, when these things happen, what do we know? These are just the rumblings, the birth pangs. I have never been pregnant, although sometimes I look like I'm three months. But I also understand this. When the pangs happen for delivery, the birth hasn't happened yet. It is just the indicator that the birth is about to happen. So as we experience these signs, and Jesus tells a bunch of them, right, so that these things will happen, there's wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, those things are going to happen, pestilences are going to happen, even the things are going to happen in the skies, all these things are signs. And then he goes on and says this phrase, he says it right in the middle, he says, but the one who endures, everybody say endure, Endure. we're meant to keep going in the midst of all that's happening around us. And the church and the Christian needs to become strong and resilient. Because today it's so easy to walk away, to give up. So easy to say, I'm just going to live my way. I'm just going to do what's comfortable and convenient to me because I face some difficulty, because I'm facing hardship. You know, in a church community, you're bound to rub each other the wrong way. There's going to be a little unhappiness. And through that, we learn to endure. We learn how to stretch. We learn how to forgive. We learn how to become resilient as we walk through these seasons. 
And then Jesus said this, and this gospel of the kingdom will pro be proclaimed throughout the whole world. Interesting. When Jesus is talking about the end times, he says, here's the signs, but this is what's going to happen. The gospel is going to go to the whole world. And then there are four stories that Jesus is going to tell. Four parables that all have to do with this coming. All have to do with the second coming as we think about the end times. The first story is the parable of the good and evil servants. All of this addressed to who? The disciples. So these are not stories about Christian and non-Christian. These are all stories about you and me. So Jesus was saying, you know what? Some of you, huh, you think you are very happening because you're my disciple, but some of you are going to miss it. So good and evil servants. And, and the point is actually very simple. How we treat one another is going to be a key indicator of whether we're ready for his return. How we treat one another. And then there's the next parable. There's the next story. It's the parable of the ten virgins. You might be familiar with this. There is a bridegroom who is coming back. And there are ten virgins waiting. Now, there's a little bit of a history here. How we understand this is basically that weddings are a little different than ours. Our weddings, we all come together, we eat, we mark on, we celebrate. It's a great thing. Theirs was oftentimes in different places, and so the people would be waiting for the bridegroom to return. And what they would do is all the village and the people would stand by along the path waiting for him to come back. Now, sometimes, because, you know, they have a very different system, the bridegroom might take a really long time. So in the story, the virgins who are waiting all fall asleep. Tired lah, you know? I'm sure if you just stand there and wait, 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 after a while, you're also like, okay, like, we sit down first. After we sit down, then we fall asleep. But when they wake up, they suddenly realize, oh no, all our oil is gone. Five of them had oil that they had prepared. Five of them did not have. Then they panic. Hey, give me some. Leh. They said, we cannot give you. Oh yeah, what do we do? So they have to try and rush and find oil. And because of that, perhaps they might miss the bridegroom's return. Point very simple. We need to not only anticipate, but prepare for a long wait. That's the point. We need to anticipate and prepare for a long wait. The third story then is the parable of the talents, which is what we're going to look at today. And the fourth is going to be the parable of the goats and sheep. All of this having to do with Jesus' return. Today, we're just going to look at the third story, the one right in the middle. So here's it. Then Jesus tells us the story. For it, now what is the it? The it has to do with the kingdom of heaven. Everybody say kingdom of heaven. So this entire story is going to be about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. If you're not familiar with this, let me explain to you what the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is like. When God created everything, heaven and earth were together. They coincided. There was this wonderful relationship between God and man. They walked together in the cool of the evening. There's this wonderful union and connectivity between God and man. God's space and man's space interacted with each other. And then man became sinful. And in choosing sin, heaven and earth separated. And ever since then, God has been desiring to come and be amongst us. Funny, Christians can't wait to die and go to heaven. God can't wait to come and be amongst us. And so what did God do? God said to a group of people, I've chosen you because I want to reveal myself to you. And so in the Old Testament, there was a tabernacle and God's presence was made, man made manifest in their midst. And then we go to the New Testament and Jesus himself comes as the perfect embodiment of heaven and earth. Fully God and fully man. Heaven and earth comes together in order to encounter us. And then Jesus starts to teach and Jesus starts to heal and Jesus starts to cast out demons. Why does he do this? Because he's showing us what the reality of heaven must look like. This is key. If you and I get an encounter and understand what the reality of heaven must be like, then we can step into it ourselves. Now what's going to happen is this. Jesus is going to die on a cross. He's going to be buried. He's going to resurrect. And then he's going to ascend and step back into heaven. And what does God do? God says, now I'm going to send my presence to a small group of people. And as we look through the book of Acts, we see this. The Holy Spirit comes and empowers the small group of people. God's presence in their midst. And what do they do? They go around and they tell people, and they demonstrate the kingdom. Why did they do that? 
why did they go around tell people? Why did they go around and demonstrate? Perhaps they remembered Jesus' teaching. Perhaps they remembered Jesus' words to them where he said, remember this, that what needs to happen while you wait for me to come back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords is to ensure that the gospel will be preached to every people group. In fact, what we know is this. They did a pretty good job because the good news of the gospel started to spread right across the earth. And here's what we know. One day in our future, the King of kings and the Lord of lords will return to make heaven and earth one again. That's our future hope. That's what we're looking for. We're not looking to die so that we can go to heaven, sit on a cloud, play a harp, and sing some songs. We're waiting for the king to come back to rule and reign. Put right everything that was wrong. Heal every disease. Heal every sickness. Take away every sorrow. Everything that's brought tears in this age is going to go away because the rightful king will be upon the throne. Now, some of you, this is super exciting. Some of you don't get it yet. So I will tell you a story about the Lion King. It's been a while, so I feel it's important to remind you about The Lion King. Those of you who are new, it's one of my favorite movies. So in The Lion King, if you remember, when there was problems and the king was thwarted and killed and eventually Scar pretends to be king, what happens to the land? Everything starts to go dark. Everything starts to fall apart until Simba, the rightful king, returns. When Simba, the rightful king, returns, the land becomes green and fresh again. Remember? Right? There's a, the circle of life, you know. It's the return back because the rightful king has taken his place. Do you understand the power of that story is the reflection of the gospel? Because we today are living in a land where the wrong kings are in place. The wrong idols are trying to rule the land. And one day, the rightful king of the universe is going to take his rightful place, not in heaven, but on earth. And when that happens, everything will be made right. Everything will be put in its order. That's our hope. That's the truth of our future. But what do we do while we wait? What do we do while we're anticipating? Amen. What do we do while we anticipate his coming? That's what this story is about. So Jesus says it will be like a man going on a journey. Remember, a lot of these parables are also not allegorical, meaning we don't need to look for every detail and say, this represents this and this represents that. Don't try to do that. It's a story to make a point. So uh, it's about a story about a man going on a journey. And he called his servants. Now, in our English translations, we often use the word servants, but the actual Greek word is the word slave. The reason we use the word servants is because of the sensitivities of the way we interpret the word slave today, right? Uh, but their slavery was very different. The concept of slavery was very different. Here's all you need to know to understand this parable. A slave did what the master required, full stop, right? If you had slaves, the reason you had slaves is so that they could do your work for you, basically, because they believed in this idea that the, the good life was to sit down and do nothing and then people do everything for you. So you would get as many slaves. As, by the way, we also think that, right? Which is false, huh? but we tend to think that. Right? Therefore, you know, yesterday, oh, yesterday was really great. So we had the GrowCon uh, and we learned so much. One of the points that happened yesterday was this. Today, we're also like them. So instead of buying slaves, what do we do? We buy machines. Right? So robot vacuum cleaner, you know, like, you know, blending machine can do everything. No need to do anything by hand anymore. And so they believe this, so that the servants would be the ones who would work hard and fulfill everything. What you need to know about this for this story is basically this. Servants are to do what the master requires. That's it. Just do what the master requires. And here's what we're told. The, uh, the man who left entrusted his property. If we get this, we will understand something deeply powerful. Right now, you have been entrusted with something. Can you turn to someone? eyeball them, you have to eyeball, this is really key, eyeball them, and say you've been entrusted. I don't know how you feel about being entrusted with something. Some of you like, oh, some of you, some of you, don't care. 
But I remember a season in my life when I was renting from some friends, right? And so um, uh, uh, Vicky's parents uh, had a, a brand new apartment and I had to, didn't have time to figure out my, my space, so I was renting from them. And I was fully aware that they had entrusted me this space and that I was going to, after six months, give it back to them. I was so careful with the house, so careful. Like every time I would shower, and it was quite often, you know, there was a, like a shower, uh, cut, not curtain, the plastic one is called water. Screen, good word, right? So there was a shower screen. I know when you shower, it all gets wet. Every time I shower, I will wipe it down. <laughs> Why? So that there's no watermark. I do not do this in my own house. <laughs> Why? Because I was entrusted with something. Or I recognized I, was had to, I had to return something in a couple of weeks and months. If you are entrusted with something and you have that deep sense of responsibility, then we want to figure out how do we be good and look after what we've been entrusted. And what happens in the story is one gets five, one gets two, and one gets one. We love to major on this idea. Because, wow, not fair. What? How come I get five? How come I get two? How come I get one? Or, yalah, I'm only the one who get one. That's not the point. It's not why Jesus... Or why does the man give two? Or why does the man uh, give one? That's not the key thing. All we need to know about it is they were given a different amount. Now, what were they given? They were given talents. Here again, the English translation makes us think this is about your giftedness. So, do you know you have a talent? All of you have talents, right? Turn to someone else and say, you have a talent. You are talented and you're gifted and God has given you a lot of capacity. But when we use the word talent, we tend to, tend to think of it as an ability to do something well. So for instance, Joseph has got the talent to play guitar. Does he play well? He does. Joseph has the ability to sing. Does he sing? He sings well. He also has the talent to play and sing at the same time. Right? So he's pretty talented. That's what we tend to think about when we use this word talent. But that's not what it means in the story at all. It comes from a Greek word, talenton. And that's why you get the word talent. And the word talenton was really a unit of measurement because what they would do is they would measure the value of gold or silver by its weight. And so you put a bunch of silver on one side and then you put a talent or two talents and then that would be the worth. So here's the thing. One talent is a measurement of value. If you were to think about its translation, and I tried to do some research around this because I wanted to figure out how much is one talent in Singapore money today? If you're tuning in online, perhaps you can write in the chat, guess, how much do you think one talent is worth? You cannot Google that. Uh, one talent is worth uh, today. Anybody here wants to guess? How much do you think one talent is worth today? Three dollars? Thousand? Hundred and fifty? Thank you for your um, uh, participation. Completely wrong. One talent today would be worth about three million. That is exactly the reaction. <laughs> you see, when they heard the story, the disciples sitting there, and he went, one was given five talents, they all went? Because five talents is three million times five. Fifteen million dollars. When someone is given two talents, it is still six million dollars. One talent, you know what? Do you understand why now it's not about five, two, or one? Because if Jesus gives me, or the man gives me three million dollars, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I'm very happy with the one talent. The point is they were given something of immense, mind-blowing value. That's the point. So they were given something that was so valuable, it blew their minds away. And then they had to do something about it. Now why, if you want to know, why were they given a difference? Because of their ability. And here's an important thing. We have different graces. There's a different sphere and grace upon our lives. For some, we can do this, 
and we can do this really well. For some, we can do this, and we can do this really well. For some, we have this, and we can do this. Really. We all have different graces. The worst thing, and it's the thing we love to do a lot, is we love to compare, right? We love to look at one another and, oh, must be like that. My church must be like that. Oh, my church must be like that. How come that church can do this? How come my family can do it? My family, you know, like, we look at Instagram, laggy worse. Right? At first, I was very happy with everything in my house. Then I look at my friend's house. Wow, my house not nice, eh? Right? And so we end up comparing. Comparison is the thief of joy. We're not supposed to do that. We need to understand the grace over our lives. Because the five and the two did the same things. So what did they do? The one who had five talents, he went at once and he traded. Now, this is a word that actually just means work. This was uh, somebody who then went and worked it. Now, I have never had that kind of money, but I cannot imagine how difficult it must have been for these guys to work that amount of money because they couldn't just invest into stocks and bonds and do those kind of things. They didn't exist. There was banking then, but primarily, how would they grow the money? They would have had to buy fields. They would have to then produce crop. They would then have to sell the crop. That's how they would in increase it. This is not easy, light work. It's not just I trade online and then I go and drive a Ferrari and then I trade online. No, they had to work hard, diligently, day in, day out, for a long, long time. The guy who had five, what did he do? Immediately, there was an urgency. I'm not going to waste time. I'm going to do this. Why? He is a slave. A slave doesn't sit around and go, when I feel like it, I'll do it. I'm going to do it right now because my master has required this of me. The guy who had two talents, exactly the same. One with one talent, what does he do? He hides the money, digs a hole, and puts it there. And he decides to do nothing. So let's try and make sense of the story. Three servants, and what we like to do, we say the issue is the comparison between how much they got. Wrong comparison. The comparison is between these two groups. What is the difference between these two groups? Let's look at it. In the first group, the one who had five and the one who had two, what happened? They were given something of immense worth. Same or different with the one who had one talent? Same. The one who had one talent was also given something of immense worth. Now, what happened to the group that when they were given this immense uh, wealth and worth, what did they do? They decided to do something about it. They labored to increase it. What happened to the guy who had one talent? He decided to do nothing about it. He just buried it and hid it in the ground. When the master comes back, the master sees both of these groups and he says to one group, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with little. Now come and enjoy the joy of your master. There was a commendation. There was a blessing. There was a, you are going to be duly rewarded for this. But what about the one who hid it? There was actually a condemnation. And there was a very strong condemnation. What you have is also going to be taken. And I'm going to give to this one because I can trust this one. This one has been entrusted with it and has worked hard with it. There's also this weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, what we'd like to do is we'd like to say, now, what does all of this mean? You know, is it your salvation is lost? Is it uh, suddenly also Christian can go to hell? Don't worry about that. Worry about this that if you choose to be this person, you're going to end up in a very, very tight, difficult circumstance and situation. Basically, what Jesus is saying is this. Pay attention to this guy and don't be like him. That's basically it. The reason he tells the story is be careful that you are not like this. This is what we do while we are waiting. So let's make some observations. Observation one, God has a heart for increase. God has a heart for increase. God wants increase. He wants us to labor so that we are growing and we're increasing. But here's the clinch. God doesn't want us to increase so that we grow and we are better and we are stronger and we are more developed. Good to do that, but that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is not take this now and go and say, you know, uh, to your life group, yeah, we must increase, must get more people. We must increase, we must be more often, we must increase, more tithing. All good lah, but that's not the point. When God says that his heart is for increase, 
His heart for increase is not that you and I develop and become better alone. His heart for increase is that the kingdom of God increases. That's the difference. It's not that I am now, I can play the piano, I become a better pianist. I play the piano and now I can perform before larger people. I, I've got, you know, 50 people as my followers, now I've got 2,000 people. As my, it's not about that. Even though God desires for us to mo be motivated to serve more, whatever the grace upon your life, it's God's desire that the kingdom increase. The kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God increase. So here's it. God's heart is that His kingdom, rule and reign, increases on the earth. That's what He desires. Not that we are strong and big and powerful. His kingdom is known on the earth. His kingdom is going to be expansive on the earth. God's heart is that His kingdom, rule and reign, increases on this earth. And here's the thing. He has left this responsibility to His church. He's left his, the responsibility of seeing his kingdom increase on the earth to his church. Turn to someone next to you and say, that's you. So if I give you the main thought I think comes out of this story, it's this. Multiply the kingdom geographically. Just around you. Are you in an office and you've got eight people in your team? Multiply the kingdom around you. If you own a company and you have influence over this, multiply the kingdom around you. Isn't that what they did? Right? If you think about it, why is it that these disciples eventually end up doing this? What do they do? They receive the Holy Spirit and they go and they multiply geographically. They go to Ephesus and they go to Thessalonica and they go to Corinth and they take the gospel right around with whatever they knew how to do. They multiplied the gospel geographically. You know, it's so important for us to recognize that. Right now, around you, in your world, your neighbor, multiply the gospel, multiply the kingdom around you. We are meant to multiply the kingdom geographically. As we try and land this a little bit, there's something else going on. And in this story, there's a little twist. The twist is this. After a long time, you will see the echo of this in the parable of the virgins. In the parable of the virgins, what Jesus is saying with that story is that the bridegroom might take a long time. Now hear me. Today we hear a lot about Jesus coming as being very eminent, very soon. So it must be very urgent. True. We must live with an awareness that we're in the 11th hour. But what if Jesus is going to take a long time? That's also what's going on in the story. So it's very simple. If Jesus... Okay, uh, the, okay, Gary, thank you for sitting in front. Everybody say, hi, Gary. <laughs> Gary, tonight you're going to get a visit from the angel Gabriel. And the angel Gabriel is going to come to you and you're not going to be told you're pregnant. That's good. But what you are going to be told is exactly December 25th of this year. Okay, this is a story. Okay, so just in case you just tuned in, I'm not prophesying. I'm not saying any of that. Okay, just a story. An angel comes to Gary and says, December 20, uh, 25th this year, Jesus is going to come back in all his power and glory. What does Gary do? What do you do if you knew for certain Jesus was coming back at the end of this year? You do everything, I hope, you do everything you know how to to tell people about Jesus, to tell people about the kingdom, to tell people, actually, you need to understand this. And if someone rejects you and says, like, stupid, like you, you go and find somebody else. You just keep it because there's an urgency that this has to happen. When Jesus returns, game over. Now, what happens if the other situation happens? If the angel Gabriel comes and says, Gary, Jesus is going to come back in 200 years. Some of us, oh, good luck, I really like. <laughs> but if you have been entrusted and you understand the value you've been entrusted, you don't just think about the small situation, you think generationally. You start thinking not just about me, not just about us, you start thinking generationally. How do we ensure the next generation gets the kingdom of God? 
They enter it, they experience it, they understand it, and they understand the call to give it to their next generation. How to ensure that that generation gives it to the next generation? When we ensure that the gospel goes from generation to generation to generation, then we can prepare ourselves as we wait for his return. Diagrammatically, the early church took the gospel and they spread it to their known geography. They went around. And then that first generation died, but they left the gospel in the next generation. And that generation went out a little bit more. And that generation died, and they left it in the next generation. And that generation went out a little bit more. Until today, the gospel is all over the earth in small tribes in Africa, in little homes in Indonesia, in big churches in South Korea, in India, in the United States, in Canada, in Singapore, in Playfair Road, all over the world. They not just went out geographically. They ensured that the next generation would get it, and the next generation would get it, and the next generation would get it, until it came all the way down to you. The gospel was faithfully passed on. Until now, you and I, we have it. The point of the parable, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with this truth of immense value, of unspoken, unparalleled value? The most important thing, changing everything in your world, Everything about your future. What are you going to do with this treasure, this talent? Will you hide it? Will you keep it for yourself? And when you meet the master, yeah, my salvation, thank you. The purpose of the story is to say, here's what we need to do. We need to multiply the kingdom geographically and generationally. That's it. It's simple. But tiring, simple but hard, simple but faithfully working life after life, community after community, people group after people group. I love that our church is willing to take the gospel geographically. But what we do collectively, we must also do personally. You have a geography. You have a space around you. Would you multiply the kingdom of God? You don't have to have 10 talents or five talents. The kingdom of God given to you, the treasure of his goodness. Take it to somebody around you. There's one other comparison that I think is quite interesting. And it's a comparison with these two groups as well. Remember, and this is the one we all like to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. But do you know the comparison to the other side? One is good, the other is evil or wicked. So we know there's a comparison between these two. And therefore, we have the faithful and the lazy. So lazy is compared with faithful. So to be faithful is to be diligent and hardworking for the sake of the kingdom. To be diligent is to take the gospel and the truth of the kingdom of God that you have experienced and work it so that other people experience this as well. We are called to good faithfulness. And what's the best thing we can do is to help people encounter the king. So real practical, is it okay? What do we do? Here's what I think we can do. Would you help someone around you and someone coming after you know Jesus. That's it. Now, some of you may have uh, the gift of teaching. What you do is this. You use your gift of teaching to help people know Jesus. It's not about saying, I'm a great teacher, I'm an awesome teacher, I want to grow my gift as a teacher alone. The reason we grow and develop is so that the kingdom is going to grow and develop. Some of you have the gift of healing. So what do you do? You pray for people for healing so that they encounter Jesus and they know that the kingdom of God has health and wholeness in it. Some of you have the gift of encouragement. So what you do is you lift people up. You give them courage, the exhortation. You challenge them and say, hey, come on. You can live better. And why are you doing all that? So that we will help people know Jesus. That's it. 
And you do this for those around you. And maybe in your circle, you've got five people. Do it with five. Maybe in your influence is 5,000. Then do it with 5,000. But then let's also think of next. Perhaps you're a parent right now and you've got teenage children and you've figured out some stuff of how to help teenagers walk with Jesus. What you should do is not just invest in your children, you should find another family who's got kids in primary school. And you say, you know what? I want to help you know Jesus while you are parenting primary school kids. You might be a retiree in the 60s and 70s and 80 years of age. And what do you do is you find a 70-year-old and a 60-year-old Someone thinking about retirement. And what you do is you help them figure out how you can be purposeful, how you can work well and continue the mission even though you're stepping into retirement. What do we do all the time? Multiply the kingdom geographically and generationally. Because I think if we do just that, and this is what the story says, we will stand before God one day and he'll say, well done, well done. You know, there's lots of things going on in the world. There's lots of churches that do great and do incredible things. But you know, there's a grace in our church. There's a grace in our community. And it's so important that we're not like the one servant who just received it and hid it in the ground. It's so important that not just a few, but all of us are engaged in this work of multiplying the kingdom. And so maybe at the end of the age, what would happen in the midst of this is a tiny little influence. A few more people came into the kingdom. A few more church plans happened because of the faithfulness of us as a community. Maybe that's all will be the legacy of what we have. But that's brilliant if that's the grace over our lives. If that's the faithfulness that we have to say, yes, God, because of this great value that you've given us, we want to multiply it. And maybe on that day, Jesus will look at us and say, well done, well done. Interestingly, what's supposed to happen with the well done is in the well done. And that is to make sure that we are not lazy, but we do the work of the kingdom. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do now that you know this story to multiply his rule and reign with a few, with many, around you geographically, and after you generationally as well? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. <laughs> and sometimes very scary. <laughs> But we know, God, that you give us truth and we know that you give us grace, grace sufficient. So Lord, I pray that there's nobody here who's going to be guilty. But we're going to recognize that the reason, Lord Jesus, you tell us the story. It's because we know that you empower us to be able to. Stir our hearts right now. And may we be like the servants that quickly and urgently went out and traded and worked for the sake of the kingdom. We thank you that you have graced us and we receive it. In Jesus' name, amen.